Dan, how are things? Good, thank you. Busy, I'm sure. Very busy, but gl- really glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. No, no, and it, it, very excited about doing so. We've spoken about it for a while, and we've spoken about doing it up at Edinburgh many, many times, and here we are in London as these conversations. I know, so I don't get to see the gym. I don't no, get to see you, the gym. We'll, get, we'll get you up. We'll get you up. But community is the biggest buzzword in the fitness industry right now, other than one that we've been using for a while, which is hybrid. But, but we'll we'll get onto that. But you built wit on community. You were one of the first movers in that space. Why did you spot the importance of that as a non-measurable metric so early on where others might not have done? I think we I think you're right we were one of the first movers um which we're still quite proud of. I think we we spotted another community in the CrossFit community if we're honest. Um we spotted um people who had previously probably been in sports teams or probably been in, in, involved in some sort of camaraderie at school or university who found these strange places in the CrossFit gyms. Uh, and then they they kind of started to live off every word the coach would say. And that wouldn't be just the coaching, that would be what they're wearing, uh, footwear and clothing. Uh, so we thought there's something in this. Um, and then, so we actually focused directly on that community at first. We knew who our customer was. We knew what they were passionate about. We were passionate about it, which is important, like fitness training and getting improving lives through that or through CrossFit. And um, we could see how powerful it was, and 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 we, so we focused on on that community, and and we we kind of knew that it, it would work. If if I'm honest, there's been a big evolution of the brand, very yeah. big evolution, yeah, yeah. which we'll we'll unpack, but we'll go right back to the beginning with that that isolated understanding that you had at the time. What connected you and Sam together? to decide this is what we're going to focus on and build the business from there. So I did CrossFit um, at the time. So I was one of those people, you know, wearing the same Reebok shorts and shoes as everyone else. Uh, Sam wasn't at that time. You, you looked a bit more feral back then, didn't I you? I did, yeah. I looked. I think I looked older, actually. People say... I, uh, no, I, I, I would agree, now, actually. But, uh, beard, I had more beard, hair, long but, hair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got more hair here now and less... Anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I did CrossFit. And Sam and me worked in a running uh, business together. Uh, I was at university and he was a little bit younger. Uh, so I had the idea of the business. Um, I, th- I thought CrossFit was just the beginning of training and fitness becoming a sport in its own right. And I thought that the consumers, the consumer base would grow and brands would start to take no- notice of it. Sam still worked in the running industry. So he 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 had been speaking to Nike Reebok adidas uh, etc and he had heard the same they, they were about to focus on fitness as a sport in its own right and they had no distribution so we thought you know we, we'd worked in running retail where it, retailers are so important to brands to be authentic to the customer we thought this is going to happen with fitness so let's do it before anyone else does what were the next steps to that because obviously it sounds very simple okay here's an idea off we go <laughs> let's start a distribution business not one of the lowest hanging fruit <laughs> yeah, businesses yeah. to get going <laughs> that is so, so true young lads decided right there's something to go out here what gave you the confidence to attack it and what were the next steps gut feeling that was that was I, that was absolutely number one um we we lived in leeds and we thought we got a gut feeling this is going to work. Where's it going to work? It's not going to work in Leeds. <laughs> Let's go to London. Uh, and that's it. Uh, so, uh, you know, I packed up with my girlfriend, persuaded her to move to, Le- to London. Sam came down with me. And we, we we were lucky enough to know people in the industry. So we, we, we managed to build it around a physical, a small physical space, which we actually got on really, really good rental terms. Otherwise, it probably wouldn't have been possible. But we had, we had a gut feeling it was going to work. We knew it would work in one place because that's where the demographic was. And we we didn't have any fear. Though. That's the real key, isn't it? That space at the core of it, the core of the brand, the, the original, the, yeah, the, the, the space we had. The, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. It's, that's always been the beating heart of the business, and it's always been what set you apart from others. I know things have evolved since then, which which means that that's not necessarily viewed in the same light that it was. But how did you adjust to as you grew? I'm sure if it was being analysed by a, a venture capitalist or a, or a PE firm, they'd say, well, actually, this space isn't necessarily contributing to the yeah. mission of the business. What what made you decide this is what we need to build from the ground up with rather than, okay, let's get a big warehouse and build our distribution from there? Because there's, there's no logical reason that the space would have been the first step, is there? There's no logical reason. Uh, again, and people, um, in fact, have got a story that when we took that first space, my uh, father and my and my stepmother came down to London to, to, for our opening and they sat in this like posh wine restaurant opposite. And she came in and she said, first thing she said to me was, he, she, she goes, the owner of that restaurant says, nothing ever works here in, in this unit. 
We were Thanks. like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so you're right. Everyone thought the same. Um, so we 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 just had a feeling that you, having a physical space would be entirely different to what anyone has ever done. If we could get it on reasonable commercial terms and it makes financial sense, we thought that it would be unique. And then when we moved to the space that you you know of and you you've been to that that gym space. Again, totally unique, and because we we trained in in gym environments and CrossFit environments, we we know that that's where the customer who the customer who trains five six days a week, and has fit fitness as central to their life, lifestyle as you know you you're, you work with the same people want to hang around with the same people in the same spaces that they feel comfortable in. They want to talk about fitness and health, and we thought let's do it. Give let's it build them. it around that. Yeah, let's give it to them. Yeah. Where was the first base? So we had short. We had um near the, our city space on um bow lane in the city then we had a, a really cool store in shoreditch um not far from here and then it was the big one in in um in the city which yeah. was one new change which is one new change uh, yeah. was was as recognizable in the world of crossfit for many many years as yeah. matt fraser was or rich froning was i guess when it was uh the big neon sign yeah i think we were the most famous crossfit gym in the world uh like obviously you could argue maybe mayhem or invictus but they had more bra- they were more like crossfit brands and driven by individuals whereas we we were driven by that space, as you said, uh, and and we it was always so important to the brand. And you're right, uh, some other people involved in our business in the latter stages thought it wasn't, but uh, physical space is so important. We're still seeing it now with the community brand. It's almost become more important in recent more years, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah which is uh, you you were right all this we, time. We, we were right, Are and we were early. That, Are you <laughs> yeah. bitter about that at all? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not bitter. Remember, no blame. No, no blame, blame, no blame. Yeah. We discussed this beforehand. Yeah. I apologise. But the the growth of a distribution business, again, low margins, high stress, high risk, lots of things can go wrong. Two young lads from Leeds moving to London optimistically. What were the biggest challenges that you had to overcome in the sort of first couple of years? Well, back then, retail distribution was, yes, it was a nightmare logistically, but it was okay as a business because um, we were in an industry sector, remember, of training or fitness where we were new. We were the first mover. Um, we were telling people what the shoes were, for example. So, we, you know, we it was like selling candy to babies, really. Uh, so although margins were not as big as a own brand business, it was easy to sell product. We were selling out of product. Every product we bought, we sold out of. So those uh, three, four years were quite easy. It's when the bigger the business, a business like retail, the bigger it gets, it gets very, very complicated from a, a tech uh, operational logistics perspective. And that's when maybe the two lads from Leeds with the dream had some challenges. Yeah, um, <laughs> But originally, again, it was pretty easy originally just because we hit the space at the right time. And fun, I assume. So fun. Uh, the, the early stages um, are so fun. Yeah. When you got to those tech challenges, scaling challenges staff management startup funding all the big buzzwords that surround the stage that you would have been at did you have to look at delineation of duties delegation what were the big focus points that allowed you to actually break through the ceiling of challenge that that came people yeah m- most important people delineation of duties we put i probably didn't do that well enough throughout my whole journey at wit actually as a ceo i probably didn't delineate the duties well enough maybe until the last stages um, but that was definitely the most important from a tech perspective you know our systems were were fine, but it is the back end, you know, the the delivery warehouse operational. Um, we outsourced that kind of pretty early on because we we were trying to fulfil out of our store and getting up five hundred orders a day and having people running around in in the stock room in the dark. Um, but you you most of it's learn on the go at that stage. Um, you bring people in who are specialists; they understand how to build out logistics and just go from there. Is there a moment that you highlight as the as the big turning point? Because you you joined CrossFit in its embryonic stages in many ways, and then commercially and I guess in terms of visibility, it blew up in mid teens, yeah. more, and then it kind of blew up again late teens. Was there a moment that you were stood in the space thinking, "Fucking hell, what have we done here?" Was it, are there any real highlights that stick out as the I can't believe what we've created. This is the best thing in the world. Yeah, I think, um, well, it's weird because I didn't, I never really felt like that ever. Um, aside from maybe when we had some special, really special events in that physical space, which is ironic because, you know, online we might be selling on one day of 3,000 Matt Fraser shoes, which he obviously produces a good amount of revenue. But I was more excited and more touched by 300 people coming to an event. Uh, and th- those are the, the special moments, yeah. 
Definitely. It, it, it's so I've been to some of them, and they were always, you have, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. I've been to many. You've of them, led actually. some of them, yeah. Yeah, they they, they they were fantastic, and the space was so so well suited to it. One you change. It's not a cheap spot. It's not a cheap spot at all, by any means. I've uh, spoken in the offices directly above that belong to Philip Morris International. Yeah. They've got big, big space. And I remember walking into uh, those offices thinking, <laughs> nope, this isn't cheap either. Yeah. And I thought, well, it's been down here this whole time. The risk tolerance decision-making that went into committing to that site when you did, how was that managed? How did you decide to pull the trigger? Was it, again, gut feeling? Did you have outside assistance in terms of financial modeling and forecasting? Or did you, again, lead with your gut on that one? There's an element of gut um, because we thought that taking it from a store to a gym could be really special. Um, but no, there was, there was... Remember, we'd had a store, we'd had a store for two, two and a half years by then. So we did have two and a half years of data. We could see our online sales growing. So we could see the uh, sales per square foot in the store. Um, we, we worked with guys in Gus, uh, you know, Gus that, yeah. that had worked in gyms. And so they, they, they know the commercials of gyms. So we, we, we knew it would be tight, <laughs> but we knew it would work. Um, and it really did work before COVID like commercially. It always worked brand wise, but before COVID, it really did work. Um, and, I think we're proud of the, how we could drive so much revenue through that space pre-COVID. How did your own interaction with fitness, health and well-being evolve as you became more engrossed in scaling the business? Because I can imagine that was difficult to balance. Yeah, it's ironic because I, I think those pictures you've seen of me with the beard and skinny, pasty, and with this, the beard and receding hairline is probably, obviously when I started where I trained constantly in CrossFit gyms and you go through this funny like three, four year period when you're not that training that much and you've got your own gym. Um, and then I, t um, I realized that it was important to, to practice what you preach and, and for mentally, obviously, as you know, was equally important to me. So I, I, I've always trained hard, but there was a little bit in the middle where I went off the rails. Yeah. And you, you deviated from CrossFit before that was a cool thing to do. <coughs> Buzzword. I did. Yeah. With the double, well, not the double. Sorry, that that was what I did. That, that was what I ended up doing. Yeah. That wasn't that wasn't a that was an accidental <laughs> slip of the tongue. That was me being a dick. The brutal, the brutal, which yeah. you've done. And I remember we exchanged messages after I foolishly had done the double. And I remember thinking, it it, it kind of struck me at the point because I, I remember what what has always not drawn me to CrossFit is how confined indoors it is. Yeah, yeah. For whatever reason, maybe it's growing up in Scotland, maybe it's the exposure to sport I had growing up, all things I'm very grateful for. I just morally reject the fact that a C2 bike is an indoor version of an outdoor <laughs> yeah. thing to some degree. And if if things can be done outdoors, they should be done outdoors. Yeah. So I, I, I always found it really fascinating that you decided to use that that beard and, 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 and training mentality to go out and do that. So from your perspective, training for the brutal versus the interior of a CrossFit gym, what were the different lessons that you extracted from kind of those opposing ends of the spectrum um that's an interesting one i think um the brutal as you know <laughs> doing a double which is mad by the way because i remember when people were doing a double i was thinking they're mad um is kind of 90 percent mindset <laughs> uh, even if you you're, you're fit and you train for a year or whatever it hurts it really hurts um whereas i think um, so that was, and so that was maybe outside my comfort comfort zone because it, it was my mind that had to get me through that challenge. Um, whereas in the gym, I was using it as a social connection more than anything. Uh, and I came from a, a sh kind of fairly short distance running background, so the the, the twenty minute, ten twenty minute workout was was much much more much better for me. I enjoyed it. Um, whereas getting on a bike and swimming through a lake, I didn't enjoy it. So it was all mindset. Did you enjoy it afterwards? Type two fun? It's type two fun. Yeah. 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 It's definitely type two. Like, like last week I did Snowden, uh, yeah, it's 24 that. hour Snowden race. And that was definitely type two fun because during it, it's not fun. Did you seven? Was it seven. Yeah, yeah. Seven in a sentence. And that was again, mindset. Cause again, I, I do, I do have a high rise now. It's a bit of running out outside, but I'm still a crossfitter really. I still just go to the gym. It's different, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Again, it's why I'm, I, I was speaking with somebody yesterday, the, the most, oh, I think the most I've enjoyed something in the moment the past five years, two occasions, same mechanism, lifting the Denny Stones, my first strongman competition last summer, so both picking up natural stones, sweet. Im immediate gratification of has it moved or hasn't it? Whereas that, endurance yeah. is so drawn out that you get to the end, you're like, 
oh, thank fuck it's done. I'll think about this tomorrow. <laughs> that is a more eloquent way of putting it. So yeah, I think you're right. I think CrossFit is a, it's a, it's 20 minute gratification. You, you can see the end. Uh, it, it hurts, but you'll be better after 30 seconds. With an endurance event, it's you don't enjoy it really until afterwards. <laughs> Unless you're uh, you, you, you're you're incredibly mentally conditioned yeah. in certain ways, or or quite quite twisted. Yeah, and I, but but that, you you do need that. Obviously, you've done way more than me. But uh, what I found last week was you 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 do need it. It's a, it, I kind I was kind of in a position in my life where I was craving a test of mindset rather than a test of physical ability in a, in the gym. Was uh, there anything in the business that was driving that? Do you think? I just think occasionally. I like occasionally I can I do it most people do I think need to step out of the con- comfort zone to physically to make you realize what you can do personally and professionally um and the thing I did last weekend it was a, it was more um it was 24 hours of kind of the only thing you can really think about is looking at the floor so you don't fall on your face and after 24 hours you realize you haven't thought about anything apart from the floor and when can you do that in life very rare very rare especially in a big city you can't. When, yeah, but you've got a lot going on in terms of the next phase of what's happening. Yeah. Was it all up the mountain path? It was all up the mountain path, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is the most exciting path in the world. It's boring as well, yeah. Yeah, it's boring. Yeah. It's boring. <laughs> yeah. uh, the first mountain Jamie went up ever, who's now an absolute, he's doing his mountain leader qualification and everything, he's now into them, was the 21st of December. We got in the car first thing in the morning to race the sunset. I got three points on the way. We got to the top of Snowdon. It was still dark. It was very cloudy. We were at the top for as long as we could without worrying that we were going to freeze to death. They're waiting for the sun. Waiting for the sun. Came halfway down. Sun came up. Complete cloud cover. Back to the car. Had a parking ticket. Got home. Enjoyed Christmas. Three points in the le- in the mail. And I thought, oh my oh. god, what a day! That didn't quite go to plan, but it did start a, a love of the mountains oh, for Jamie go. at least. Yeah, so yeah, I uh, I know that path well, yeah. more well than I probably should. And I don't have much desire to return to it anytime no, soon. No, no. So well done, well done. I'm sure it, it, it's it's good. I think it's a calibration that I, I go through a sort of two year cycle of speed and strength versus really long. And it's the further I am away from the really long, it's kind of that desire to have that process of spending time mm. in my own head to figure things out because it's so hard to get undistracted time isn't it i agree i agree I, i've never really actually experienced it like that so i think i will do more of it in the future i think it's a really really good way of doing it being in the thick of growing the business and getting to i guess a real big turning point was was covered because i mean it was for every business but for you guys especially a retail physical store led mm. e-commerce business COVID must have been a bit of a <laughs> yeah. head scratcher here. Right, how do we attack this one? And actually, the the boom came at that point, didn't it? Yeah. The, the e-commerce demand was massively, massively stretched. I guess the revenue that, or the access or the community that people were losing through the social connection in the gym, you actually reached thousands more people all over the world through the distribution yeah. side of the business. So how did you cope in the immediate short term with the announcement that things are very, very different? And what happened next? COVID, yeah, was quite an emotional time in those first few months because uh, when those two, three days that everything was going to be shut, um, firstly, you know that the consequences for the gym. Uh, and secondly, well, you do, but you don't know the long-term consequences. And secondly, you think that even e was going to be affected. So you think that five years' work has gone down the toilet, basically. Um, <clears throat> so you think all your dreams are shattered. And then, and then yeah, you're right. We, we So we closed the gym and we think, how are we going to... How are we going to pay for this? Uh, and then e-com goes crazy. <laughs> so for like three months, you're, you're kind of sitting back and thinking, oh, this is not too bad. Um, but then you come through COVID and life in the city of London has changed. So people don't go to work five days a week, then or now. Um, they don't shop physically as much and they're not there on Mondays and Fridays. Um, so the physical site revenue drops 50% and stays 50% lower than it was for, for years, uh, in, even until recently. Uh, and online, we had major issues because supply, as as you everyone would have heard, the, the supply issues were real. Like We were reliant on Nike and we had a call in, I think, September 22 or whenever, whenever it was saying, you're not getting your order book for, the, for Christmas. And that was 3 million quid of the revenue. And it's, it's like you can't just find that revenue. No. So, so it was a massive roller coaster. Yeah, yeah. But it was it was difficult for our business. A lot of businesses went through that econ boom during COVID, where if investment or financing options and things were put on the table, the expectation from VC or private equity tended to be keeps going in yeah. that direction. And that's where 
I guess things were estimated with wit and that's where you started looking at things and, and uh, nobody knew what direction things were going to go in. A lot of businesses looked at it that way because the world is changing. This is the data we have in front of us. Let's make decisions based on that. What changes start to occur, didn't they, based yeah. on that situation? What, what were they? Yeah, I think, so first of all, we had a second tranche of investment from our private equity partners um, in the first few weeks of COVID. So fair play, because, uh, you know, yeah. it's a you know, difficult time and, and a lot of VCs pulled out of companies. But maybe they thought, like you say, that they could see, we, they'd seen the first three weeks of data and they thought it's just going to keep going. Um the issue is that the business started to suffer some distress because of the pressures I've just talked about uh, about a year later, uh, plus the onset of Brexit uh, wiped like millions off our revenue. So because um, our costs were higher than they, they should be for that revenue that we were achieving, we had to take some more money on from the private equity group, at which time we, as in me and my f- founding partner sam lost control strategic control of the business um so whilst we're with the largest minority shareholders we didn't have majority anymore so obviously with that comes some challenges because you lose strategic control which means i wasn't setting the strategy anymore um and if you don't agree with another person's strategy then that can get a bit difficult basically i can imagine there were some obstacles along the way with all that personally professionally lots of things going on sam went elsewhere at a point didn't at that as well? point yeah so sam sam went at that second point of investment because he didn't feel comfortable uh and he got a really good offer from from another brand noble who we all know um so he he left then which was no issue for me um but i felt i should stay uh yep. for for the shareholders um and i kind of probably thought i could have more impact than i than i could uh in the longer term how did you Draw a distinction between the the personal emotional attachment to what effectively was your your child, yeah, and the uh, professional understanding of the situation you were in. Was that a challenge for you personally? It's very. It's, it's, there's so many complex conflicts going on in my head because, firstly, like I said a minute ago, this investment company put a lot of money into business, uh, so you've always got to respect that. Um, and they put money into the business when it was in distress, which again you've got to respect because they're they're keeping the company afloat. Um, the problem is it doesn't mean that you don't it doesn't mean you agree with them uh, on the strategy so then like you say your baby and where you wanted to take it and the connection you want with the community the the importance of physical events and space uh, you know it, they didn't agree with that so then then it becomes emotionally challenging for me uh, and thinking like it, am i getting fulfillment out of this uh, or am i just here to for the end the financial end goal that's when it became, became like emotionally challenging what happened next? How did you ride that wave? Because I think we spoke just after you decided to 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 step back because of the fulfillment. Essentially, mm. I, I think that that ultimately became more important to you, didn't it? Was that was your day to day fulfillment and passion for the business? You you couldn't see past the disconnection to your child, quote unquote, yeah. that was unfolding before your eyes. Yeah, I was quite conflicted in general because although I'd been CEO for I think seven years. We'd been through a period of distress when I was CEO. Uh, you know, is that my fault? Is it COVID's fault? Who knows? Probably a combination of everything. Um, and then, yeah, you, you, then you fall out with your your partners um, to an extent, which is difficult. And then the fulfillment aspect. And then, like you say, um, you think, why, why am I here? And I, I tried to leave on a number of occasions, actually, before I did. Um, but I always got tempted, you know, by by people to stay um and it was driven with by the wrong things uh so then when i, I think yeah when we, we spoke in in december or january december 22 i just couldn't do it anymore uh i, I was i was emotionally broken um so i thought you know it, it's time time to leave what were the first things that you did when you because you were on gardening leave at, yeah. at that point you, you can't just go and work for Another, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, straight yeah. away, which which I guess is the world that you would know and where you'd be, you could fish around. What were the first things that you were drawn to? I guess what, where did your sense of fulfilment drive you to fill your day to day? Because I'd like to think you might have gone back to some of the things you might be missing whilst having to go through the distress of running the business. Yeah, it was really difficult at first because obviously, again, like anyone who, who leaves a job, it, you're you've got a bit of a, a hole in your life. Um, I travelled a lot, which it was great because you, you don't go on many holidays. I I've connected with the fitness community as much as possible. 
you get caught in your bubble. You know, it's like tunnel vision. You forget, you, you see people on Instagram, you see people at events, but you don't really connect with them. So I went to meet as many people in as many gyms as possible around London and the UK and abroad um, and just tried to enjoy myself like that for, for about eight months. Uh, so not really doing much else apart from that. Um, and then gradually started dipping my toe in, in back into the industry. And what did that look like? So that was initially, um, I've been supporting a few startup businesses got a couple of small investments in in health and wellness startups a couple of mentorship roles with with founders and and I I support their businesses and then in December last year I got offered a a big consultancy role at a French company uh, in Lyon uh, who 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 work with CrossFit closely and because it's it's my uh, background I thought you know I'm I'm getting stale <laughs> I need to get back into the game so uh, I've enjoyed working for them for the last 6 months how much did you benefit from the, again, I guess like the 24 hours up and down snowden, same thing, bigger level. How did you, how much did you personally and professionally in terms of staleness, because skills go dormant, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they do, they do. Benefit from that eight months in terms of reflection, action, knowing what you what to do next, what your skill set was out with being the CEO of a business yeah. that you founded and worked within for so many years. I'm sure you probably learned a lot about yourself in that period. Yeah, there's a lot of reflection. You learn a lot about yourself. You know, you, you take a step back, you realise the things you perhaps did, did do wrong as a CEO. Uh, as a person, I made some real mistakes as a person, you know, the way maybe treated some people in the business. Like when you're a CEO, sometimes you have, make, have to make hard decisions and it you know, I, I'm not proud of some of them. Um, but I think with regards to like skill set and, and, and knowing what you're good at, what you do next, that was hard because you think you start to like question your skill set. Like you say, you're getting scared, you're getting stale or what am I good at? Am I, a, am I, you know, pretty good at everything, but not a master of one thing. Um, so I think it's when you start questioning yourself that you have to get back in the game really. Yeah, it, it, I, I've often thought about this. I, I, whether this is a, a reflection on me or anything else, I found myself kind of wondering if everything went totally tits up tomorrow, what that I do on a current day to day basis could be applied elsewhere. And I guess because I'm so much in my own bubble, I almost don't think that it could be because I only view it through the lens of the things that are within the businesses that I operate. But a lot of those skills are transferable. So I often find myself kind of retreating back to this. It, it, it's a funny one because it's trying to it, it it's trying to look at things binarily. You can't do that until the lens is taken away. Yeah, and whip for you, so many years was the lens for you. So I guess the enjoyment that came from that consultancy role, obviously back in the game with Whit now, which we'll we'll come on to. But the consultancy role stuff did that tick the fulfillment box for you and really get that creative excitement juices flowing again. To an extent, I think it's because it's not your company that's a big hole. Um, and it, it can't be the same if you're not your company. Um, it made me realise I've got the skill set to, to do it again because uh, I'm uh, interim CEO in a, in a, in a fairly fast growing company. Uh, it makes you realise, sorry, it makes you not make those mistakes that I, I mentioned. You you, learn, you you take those learnings and you work with people better. Um, so it it, it it sharpened me up. It definitely sharpened me up and made me confident, very confident about my abilities, my connectivity. Uh, again, it would be like you, like my connectivity in the space is considerable and that adds a lot of value. Gives you a bit of confidence. Confidence that's led somewhere. Yeah. Which is the rebirth, the relaunch, however you want to frame it. I mean, formally it's a, a relaunch, but I guess yeah. you probably view it as a rebirth in many ways. So in terms of, I guess, the structure of how things have unfolded, you and Sam are now back relaunching yeah. We're in partnership with Fraser's Group, yeah. who were the ones that sort of took the majority stake when things went the direction that you've run, run us through. Yeah. When did the plan materialise for that to become reality? So we, me and Sam tried to buy the business out of administration in uh, in February. Uh, and we, <laughs> there's a, there a number of bidders, like seven or eight different bidding parties. And we quickly realised that it was there's three parties at, on the last day and one of them was in Fraser's Group. Um, they they shouldn't know who the other bidders were, but obviously they know everyone. Yeah. Uh, as part of the process, you shouldn't know who the other bidders were. So Michael Murray rang me, uh, and he goes, "Can you are you and Sam in London? Do you want to come into the office?" Sam wasn't, but I went into London. He he was on <laughs> he was on the phone, and they basically were like, "We're bidding against each other. Can you drop? Can you drop out?" <laughs> <laughs> the process and obviously it's me on my own in the room like Mike and, uh, mm, going uh, going against Fraser's group you're like oh I don't think we've got the legal fund for this well, yeah. yeah it was it was one of those and um and I think we were honest 
we 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 knew Mike already, but we were honest. We were like, it's our it's our it's our passion. Like we 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 want it back. And Mike said, well, fine, let's let's do it together. Like this was like on the last day of the admin process. Let's do it together. Um, you know, one of us comes out of the process. Let's let's shake hands here and let's let's do it together. So they ended up buying the business out of administration. And true to his word. Um, it took us some time with legals, but um, a few months later, we acquired half the business um, back off him. And that's where we're at the moment, working in partnership with them. So you, are you and Sam now majority strategic stakeholders? So me and Sam invested through an SPV, which is a, a group of um, investors who put some money in. Uh, so we are uh, minority shareholders, but our group is a majority shareholder you know, now of the business. Fantastic. Okay. So we're strategically leading the the, the rebirth, yeah. So what is the strategy? <laughs> well, I can't let you into the whole strategy, but um, so working partnership with the Fraser's Group and we're, we're going to work in partnership. So obviously we'd be silly not to maximise the opportunities with them, with with systems, warehousing, you yep. know, some manufacturing. Um, but we're leading a strategic um, brand marketing plan and we're, la- we're relaunching it in November this year. Um, we're it's doing the same it- space. No, so we're not no. relaunching a space. So... We're relaunching in November this year with a small collection of our own product. Um, in January to February next year, we're launching with a bigger range of our own product uh, and potentially some other branded product. But the focus of a new WIT is going to be on the WIT brand, the WIT with the WIT clothing brand. We believe there's a, a huge gap in the market for the co- for training customer for perform- performance clothing. Uh, there's no no bull anymore in mm-hmm. Europe. There's no WIT at the moment in Europe. Like People are scrambling to know where to buy a good training product. We believe there's a gap there and we've got a big community to maximise that. Uh, and then later in 2025, maybe 2026, we will probably look at a physical space again um will it have will it be the same format as wit 1.0 probably not but we will have a space for the to we want to be the epicenter of the fitness community the place where the customer comes to spend the time where they feel comfortable they network they talk they train they shop with that 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 heritage is not going to disappear so we will build up to that so it's quite a slow but um exciting um you know strategy and I do think whilst all of the things you referenced post pandemic are still the case in terms of hybrid working, people not spending as much time in retail, I think in the fitness community, people are well, the value to the customer, the user, whoever they might be in whatever category they're in, a lot of the authenticity and alignment with brands is being reinforced by in person, in real life, community activations, that's becoming more important than it ever has been at the moment, I think. And yeah. you guys have done it once before when it didn't matter nearly as much. Yeah. So I guess there must be a real excitement to to keep riding this wave and seeing where it's going to then facilitate that. So what do you think is going to be key with the new space? Obviously, we're, we're talking in the future here and yeah. we, there's a lot to go. But w- what do you think in line with the current the current state of the fitness industry will be the things that you want to get right in that space? No, I think... Um we were, as you said earlier, we we were the original bricks and mortar fitness community space we, yeah. before before gym show. They, 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 it's a fact. Like the guys no, in gym yeah, show yeah, used yeah, to come yeah. into it all the time, and you know say that did you know, great events, space. Yeah. yeah, we did yeah, events yeah. with them. Yeah. Um, and na- now other people are doing it. Gym Shark got the second store in Westfield, which is uh, you know amazing. Regent Street guys at Pure Sport are doing an amazing job around. They've got their two sites, Hackney and. Um, and Southwark, where the where the community hubs, so I think we will we're going to do very similar again. But we, being the originals who who built our business around a a, a physical space, we we think we can do it better than anyone else. Uh, and because we think we can bring this consumer something really special, where everything we do will be built around um, train changing lives through training. So we will. Um, and we will tell stories of individuals, organisations, etc., who genuinely, tangibly change other people's lives through training. And we will we will host those individuals and organisations in our space. To, so we will to become that epicentre for health and wellness and fitness in London, and just drive everyone uh, through that space um, to to story tell and do impactful things for the community. Are you tangibly happier now that you're back in the driving seat? I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We are happier. I think it was really interesting because I didn't realise until we acquired the business back 
what a weight on my shoulders it was not owning wit anymore uh so it was like this massive weight off my shoulders uh and now it's just exciting it's, it's almost like a free hit um the, the there's obviously some diff there's some not negativity but there's some there's still some weight on our shoulders because a lot of investors lost lost money in our in our original business and me and sam were in the business when a lot of them invested originally not all of them but you know so we we you know that 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 doesn't rest easy with us but we've got an opportunity to go again so we have to take it yeah yeah and there, uh, there were some issues towards the very very tail end of order fulfillment and things like that that were yeah. it just caught up in administration as any business would be yeah and that stuff we'll have to deal with yeah um, you know that uh, at the moment um we haven't even got access to, to channels and stuff but that stuff we'll have to deal with and we we think we can deal with it successfully but uh, un unfortunately realistically like commercially the, the new business can't can't do anything about that but we want to work with individuals and organizations who are being ineffective in some way to do the right thing going forward basically and your relationship with sam is is really you're both completely aligned in the direction to go you've yeah. taken the lessons learned from what was a difficult period and the, the a team's back together i think so i think me and sam the problem was with um i was quite uh, a dominant ceo at exec team level probably um when sam was there and that we clashed a bit because we were, we were co-founders, really. Um, and um, he's gone away and really grown as an individual, working for Noble and uh, etc. And I have learned a lot uh, and how to better position myself um, as a leader. And the great thing about a new company is there's a few of us. It's not just me and Sam. We know our silos. Uh, we know who's responsible for what, who's accountable for what, and when. Uh, we come together obviously weekly, but it's clear. Whereas before, we'd I'd stick my nose into everything, he'd stick his nose into everything, and it's quite refreshing now. It does make your life simpler. So much simpler. How does that spill over into your, I guess, day to day routine structure? Because what, what really you might not even remember this, but um, when we sat down once and sort of audited a few things at my end, you with your your final question to wrap things up was. It was it was something along the lines of, but do you have any time to yourself, or how busy yeah. are you? Or because yeah. or, 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 you were great, you had all sorts. Yeah, of I mean, it's still not much better. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm sad to tell you sitting here, but it, I think I think your that 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 was a big takeaway for me was the 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 sustainability of the existence you'd clearly taken lessons from, and I think the structure that you now have, the simplicity of it, is something that you will protect like fuck rather than try and ever stick your nose in other things because you want to own it or you're like no you know what i've got my lane i want to really focus on this and trusting people around you will be very useful so it did stick yeah. with me when you asked it was i can't remember the way you phrased it but yeah, I, just I, remember, I, I had a wry smile and i thought oh he's got me there i don't know because i don't I, have the right answers I, I, i've to that seen one. it a million times as well when i mentor people it's like the, the first it's one of the first questions like at the end of the first day it's like well, you're obviously doing too much like, yeah. it's quite simple like you're either trying to do too much in the business or you're working too many hours or you're doing too much at home and business and if you half that's half the problem half the time so yeah we, we, we'll be much more sensible we know i don't think we're going to be you know when you start out or when we start out when we start out with I, I think we're working seven days a week 15 hours a day for like two years uh, and uh, both of our relationships broke down like with with girlfriends and uh that's not healthy. Um, so that's we'll never go back to that. No. No, I think the the, the big level for me, and this is where put some of my biggest personal challenges have been in this past six to nine months, is that I've always tried to make athlete first, everything else second. And I think as we've grown, those lines have become a little bit more blurry because of the commerciality of things and sort of taking things when the opportunity is there or making the most of the athletic things commercially because it makes sense to do so and those lines become a bit blurry whereby i've disconnected myself from training in and of itself because it has become intertwined with with everything else which means that what used to be an escape is now the job which means yeah. i now lack an escape and it took me about two and a half years to realize that i was like fuck wait a minute i'm not waking up on a saturday morning to go on a nice little adventure anymore i'm waking up on a saturday in the morning to work and it was just that little moment of, ah, right, okay, so therefore you need to find something to fill that gap. And yeah. it took me a long time to realise that. That's interesting. You're, you're right, because your brand was built around that the athlete. The yeah. athlete. The, the whole, yeah. whole thing is built around the athlete, so you, you've got to push that forward, right? And facilitating it for others, again, a key part of how we how we do that in terms of growth is is obviously we've got the back-end system to help do that, but to, to help access more people and help 
provide them with the same journey that I've very fortunately been on and very yeah. passionate about others experiencing requires me to keep doing silly shit. And yeah, it's that's uh, that you got yourself in a bit of a position. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's it's it, I think I think the, the thing for me is I've always been I won't like I haven't done high rocks. I'm not going to do high rocks yeah. until I wake up and decide I'm really excited to train for high rocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Commercially, it's fucking stupid I haven't done high rocks. Yeah. It's probably the worst on paper yeah, it's true, the worst true, thing true. to do. Um, Because you're the original hybrid, you see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) No, your words, not mine, on that one. We, 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 I I didn't word it quite like that, but yeah, we were using the word and actually understand what it means long before people decided. We don't. Let's not talk about that. Yeah, so so that's a rabbit hole we won't go down to. (laughs) But from my point of view, if it's raise, if it's reducing the barrier to entry for people to try different disciplines that they can get value from, fantastic. But what irritates me is that. There's people that now have massive egos that are trying to, again, raise that barrier when the whole reason this thing exists is to reduce it. But yeah, that's yeah. going to happen with anything, isn't it? Yeah. And it does make me laugh that CrossFitters, who have only just come out of the evolution of having to prove their worth to the rest of the world, are the ones bashing a <laughs> new know, space the most, isn't it? I I, Surely I you should I empathize. I don't like the bashing either Like no. that the, the, the they do. And it, it, yeah, the CrossFit on, to high thing is crazy because I even think some collaboration there would be powerful for CrossFit. Of yeah, all yeah people, massively so. Of all people at the moment, but... Anyway, that's another. The most balanced opinion that I've had on it, James Newbury, lovely guy. Yeah. Very, very run-of-the-mill, straight and narrow, Australian, very at peace with himself, weapon of an athlete, was just really curious and drawn to High Rocks. Did it, enjoyed it, can still talk about CrossFit, doesn't go, oh, well, this yeah. is better than this because of this, and this gang is the best, shouting out of his box into somebody else's box. And I think that that's, that's why I like doing my own thing but I think the challenge has been that it's been more it's becoming more and more difficult for me to find things that are as exciting to me as a, for example training yeah. for the double was because there's a lot more business responsibility that's very stimulating for me and I really enjoy which means that there's less time devoted to the the the, the conceptualizing big events what am I excited to train for um and without one it genuinely without one to sound arrogant in any way a lot of the things that I've wanted to achieve for a long time, I have now done within the standards that I personally see them as valuable yeah, being yeah, done with it. Yeah. And I'd like to swim the channel at some point, but that, yeah. I, I'm not going to do that for a fair few that years. That takes some time. To yeah, train it, as well. it's all these things. It's, but it, and then it's like, well, how much is that going to take me, take me away from what's happening here? And yeah. It so I guess that's, that, that, that's the challenge, Ben. It's it's uh, it's an interesting one to navigate, but it, it's why I ask how uh, how much has simplicity helped you day to day. So you're you're are you still consulting for a company in Leon, or is that? Yes, yeah, so yeah. I still work with them. Um, coming on Northern Spirit, they've got a very large partnership with CrossFit. Um, so that's kind of my wheelhouse. I'm, I'm I really work with CrossFit on building out their clothing range. Yeah. Uh, I I don't have any plan to to stop doing that in the short term. Um, but where is, you know, uh, they know this as well, is, is the exciting kind of yeah. <laughs> thing for me. Uh, if but, they didn't know before, they'll know it now. They know now. Um, but uh, it, they, they, it kind of mutually beneficial jobs anyway. So I'm I'm working on the product with Wit, uh, and work and I'm helping with the community, the building out of the community again and getting into gyms, et cetera. And Sam's leading brand and marketing. Um, then we got you know a couple of other people as well. So yeah. What's your take on CrossFit as a whole at the moment? Because there's there's been some changes. There's mm. been a big big decision, which was very disappointing. I mean, I I've the reason I've never been drawn to CrossFit like we discussed is because it misses that sort of true aerobic and actually do, yeah. doing the actual sports themselves. Um, it's just not yeah no slight on it whatsoever. It's just not been that I'm really excited to wake up and do this thing for me ever. But I've always enjoyed watching it. I've always enjoyed the methodology. I've always enjoyed interacting with the sport. But I'm very disappointed that it's all indoors this year, which I understand commercially from a fan base point of view of things. But if we look back to the ranch and all that stuff, I thought the coverage on that was great and that felt right to me. Yeah. I think, like you just said, I I love the methodology. I think it's done and continues to do amazing things to people. Uh, and the gyms, the affiliates, have remarkable communities. The best community, the best fitness communities out there are in CrossFit gyms. The brand is just not evolved with the rest of the industry, I don't think. Um, and and the sport probably hasn't. Yeah, the, the, the programming uh, at, at some of the the larger events, including the CrossFit Games, probably hasn't evolved with with where the customer has gone. Um, and I think that's a, probably a result of the company being too focused on the American audience still. Um, I saw a lot of backlash to, um, there was a step-up workout 
there was the hero workout yeah. that essentially was in honor of I think there was a big marketing push about the American hero and there were a lot of countries saying just remember that not everybody one believes that this person is a hero nor two cares about America and the level that you do with this marketing campaign for a global brand and there were a lot of people putting very polite formulated arguments together which really made me think about that that was the first time I really thought exactly that which is oh yeah you can really see the I mean go ruck not available anywhere outside of the US really yeah, there's, I think there's some strange there's I'd summarize it as that maybe there's a lot of strange commercial decisions that um, would probably have been different if some of the exec team or, or board were from outside the US um, but I do love CrossFit and I, I always have faith in the, in the business and the sport to evolve because you know that's everything I've done has come from CrossFit um, if you're on the board as a yeah. non-US member, not to put you on the spot, it's a, it's a very on-the-spot question, what what would be the evolutions and the changes that you would recommend, at the very least, in line with the rest of the fitness industry out with the US? Well, I've got a couple of controversial and big ones. I'd split the sport from the from the affiliates and method, methodology. So I'd split, I'd sell the sport. Basically, okay. um, I think it would be beneficial for the for the brand. I think uh, you know, let's say a, a, one of the big sports marketing agencies could take it to another level, um, and they could remunerate the athletes better, make the spectacle better. They could take it international, and I think actually that it would drip down to more people doing CrossFit and affiliates. Um, that would probably be the main thing I'd do. Um, that will never probably happen, but um, and and fundamentally, I, w- I would put I would put more Europeans in the exec team and the and, and and the board level. That's not to say, uh, by the way, the people on the exec team are high quality individuals, but I just think it needs a global perspective. Now and they're very different audiences, aren't they? I mean, even if you just look at, I mean, rugby versus the NFL, the way that fans interact, the yeah. way that people interact, the way that communities interact, totally, totally different, aren't they? Disposable income, CrossFit gyms so in the UK different. are much less accessible in terms of cost than they are in the US because generally people have more disposable in some areas and uh, Americans are much more willing to invest in their health and fitness because it's directly tied with their insurance premiums sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's yeah. It's a fascinating suggestion actually. So it's, essentially you would view the the the, the pinnacle of the sport being the comp- the competitive element being a separately a separate business whereby the feed to that comes from CrossFit HQ, however you delineate, essentially a separate business that is designed to focus on community development at whatever level. And then there'd be a middleman, agencies, pathways or something that would feed one into the other. Yeah, effectively, like someone acquire the IP to to, to own the sport uh, for a period, let's like, say 10 years. And, uh, and then CrossFit HQ can focus on the beauty and the magic of CrossFit, which is um, affiliates and getting people, yeah. doing cross, getting people doing CrossFit. Storytelling is a really key point because you know they 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 they've ignored that for the last five years. Uh, I personally think it'd be really healthy for the sport because I think it's a really complex business. Uh, you know, it's got affiliates, so it's, it's revenue. Um, there's a revenue um, piece here, and then there's um, coaching coaches. So level one, level two, level three. There's a revenue stream here, and there's a sport. So there's a level um, revenue stream here. As we were talking about about focus, I mean, what the hell do you focus on? I don't know because I don't know under the bonnet, but there's a lot going on there. There is. There is. <laughs> what would the games look like in an ideal world for you? I mean, there's some bias here. I'd love to see them just do a full distance Ironman and just see what happens <laughs> or something like that. What really <laughs> irritated me, really irritated me, was the 5,000 yard run. When it was 4,000, it was it? Well, it was it, 5K, yeah. but they never said kilometres. It was it, it, that was, mad, it was it was a deliberate and again oh it was measured with a meter stick it wasn't yeah it was a deliberate attempt to disguise the time in an attempt to present CrossFit athletes as the best at everything all at once but that irritated me because the whole point of CrossFit is not to assume that you can be the best at everything all at once because that's not possible that defeats the law of specialization but to be very good at lots of different things all at once and to tie them together in a blend for repetitions over time with blood occlusion and all the things going on is a sport in and of itself. Mm. So to do a 5K test where you've got lots of people over 200 pounds that can put 160 kilos over their head going sub 20 or lower is brilliant. Yeah. But don't say, don't say, oh yeah, yeah, all, all top tier CrossFit guys should be going 16 minutes. They shouldn't. There's yeah. no reason that they should be doing that. So it just irritated me that there was this kind of commercial attempt to those that might, because there were a lot of comments, I saw a lot of it. Yeah. Wow, it's amazing that somebody of that size can run at that that pace and all these things. Like, yeah, it would be if it was 
if it was the case. Uh, like just well, a, a 5K your- round of track would have been brilliant because it would just been right pure data where did these guys stack up against conventional opinion you think wow bob from the office who runs six days a week and weighs 65 kilos runs an 18 minute 5k and you've got Noah exactly. Olson there running 18 10 yeah that's amazing exactly yeah and and, and that, that's to your point that that's what we want to see and and people like you and me recognize the distance and versus the time and and what the top athletes w- the pace they're running at was incredible yeah but just show the real distance yeah yeah, yeah it's the, still incredible the, the, fun, it, yeah. the funny thing was though the athletes were taking the piss out of the whole thing. Uh, yeah, know, they're posting their Strava so but even then, then CrossFit HQ was saying we measured it with a meter stick and we're like oh stop just stop you've been rumbled you've been rumbled yeah. <laughs> you've been, yeah, you've been <laughs> rumbled. it's like the sat the sat doesn't lie you know yeah, yeah. it was uh, that disappointed me and again I was disappointed from a from a spectator and love of sport point of view with the games being predominantly indoor this year it's indoors. just the heat isn't it it's just the venue yeah, 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 that's it, uh, yeah. It, whether it is in Texas or Birmingham Alabama it's going to be too hot but that's just a obviously it should have evolved into a European venue now uh, you know one year or it should, it should be in Europe at least once or twice in the next few years that would solve the problem um, but yeah, it can't be outside because it's forty-one degrees. So. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's complex. And yeah. I, again, uh, while whilst I've expressed my disappointment, I'm in no way suggesting that I would have any have a, have had any better ideas at that level. It's just from a personal point of view, I won't feel as engaged to it this year as I have done previously. Yeah. So, final quick fire question: What in an ideal world do you want Wit to look like in five years? You've ran us through the sort of next three, yeah. but five years time, what do you want to have achieved? So I think we want to be a globally recognised training apparel brand. Um, as, I, as I said, I don't think there's a big, big big gap for that. So commercially, that's what we want to do. And I think we want to have the same impact on the fitness community as we had before, if not bigger. Uh, so uh, engaging more people in fitness, doing fitness, engaging more people in changing other people's lives through fitness, uh, people thinking about putting other people first. So from a fulfilment perspective, we, we would like to do that as well. Phenomenal. Well, I look forward to seeing the growth. Thank you. And I'm confident it will happen. And hopefully we can use your community space once it's live. I'm looking forward to it, yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much.